Um, yeah, thank you, Cheng, and thank you, Ali. Um, I'm really happy to be here today. So thanks for giving me the opportunity and for hosting the session. Um, I'll dive right in. What I'm going to talk about today is short-term plasticity and how best to uh, describe it in a computational model. So when I say short-term plasticity, what I mean is that neuronal communication typically is not static in that a train of consecutive action potentials won't lead to the same postsynaptic response. And traditionally, people um, like to distinguish between the uh, between facilitating and depressing synapses um, corresponding on whether consecutive spikes evoke um, increasingly or, or decreasing, decreasingly large uh, responses. Um, but we were fundamentally motivated in this work by um, a few observations um, of experimental neuroscience that this dichotomy of facilitating and depression is not really that accurate. So just to give you an example here, this is a paper from Simon Chamberlain from 2014, where he showed that at a specific synapse in the hippocampus, if you lower the extracellular calcium concentration, you don't only change the um, initial EPSC amplitude, but you also drastically change the time course of facilitation from this more classical sublinear time course to a supralinear facilitation. And findings like this challenge these, this traditional dichotomous view of depressing versus facilitating synapses um, and maybe suggest that there is something more to the story. So if you want to describe synaptic plasticity or short-term plasticity, um, the traditional approach would be something like the tzodik smart model, which is um, heavily used throughout the field. And in essence, what it tries to do, it is uh, tries to describe the efficacy of a synaptic spike um, as a, the product of a, um, the available and the utilized resources at a synapse. Um, and the, so in, in other words, the available resources correspond to something like the available vesicle pool and the utilized resources to the release probability. And then as we have a spike train, a presynaptic spike train, the available efficacy at each spike will go down and then recover again. And the release probability after each spike will go up. And then this, this product of the two, depending how you um, fit the parameters um, that go into these two differential equations, you can describe facilitating synapses and depressing synapses and a combination of the two. So here's the problem with this. This, this model is, is wonderfully elegant and simplistic in that it's um, a mechanistic model where we can take these parameters and directly um, pinpoint to a biophysical property they describe. But at synapses that are more complex, like the one I just showed you, um, we know that these phenotypes are the result of multiple interacting and independent uh, biophysical mechanisms. Um, of course, we could start you know, adding factors to this model and, and adding a factor for each biophysical property that we want to describe. But as we add factors, we also um, sort of collect a, a catalog of parameters that we then have to fit to our limited experimental data. So in order to describe complex dynamics, this, these mechanistic models become very, very complex very quickly. So we take a different approach here and we try to sacrifice some of this mechanistic interpretability and really focus on describing the, the phenotype. So in order to, just to construct such a phenomenological model, the, the, the essential um, problem that we have is to get from a spike train here in the top left to a weighted spike train, which I will refer to as an efficacy train um, here in E. And E is essentially just a weighted spike train that then can be used to you know, be convolved with some postsynaptic kernel, in this case, a current, um, to give rise to a postsynaptic response. But how do we get from the spike train to uh, an efficacy train? Um, 
Essentially, what our model does is we take a presynaptic efficacy kernel and we convolve the presynaptic spike train with this efficacy kernel. And that will give us a accumulated efficacy train throughout the spike, uh, accumulated efficacy throughout the spike train. So this linear operation is then followed by a nonlinear readout where we take a sigmoidal readout of this accumulated efficacy. Um, and we also add a baseline B. And then this nonlinear readout of the accumulated efficacy sampled at the spike times will give us an efficacy train. Um, this, this might be a bit much at first, but um, essentially it's, it's the following. We, we have a linear convolutional operation followed by a nonlinear readout um, of this, this accumulated efficacy. And what I want you to, to, to realize is that now by changing the shape of this um, presynaptic efficacy kernel that essentially describes um, how the time course of the efficacy change in response to each spike. If in this case, it's just a, a mono exponential decay with a positive amplitude. If we change the amplitude to, to be negative instead of a facilitating synapse, we will now get a depressing synapse. And in all the way on the right, I took a um, kernel that is a sum of two exponentials with opposite sign and different time constants. And that will give us a combination of a synapse that's first facilitating and then depressing. Okay, but th this, these are all, um, this is still this dichotomous view of the synapse. So um, what about more complex dynamics? So in this supralinear facilitation example that I, that I showed you, um, we can model this by changing the baseline um, parameter. So because we have a nonlinear readout of the accumulated efficacy, this is a sigmoidal function, we can set here again, I, I, I take in, in E top left, I take a presynaptic efficacy kernel, and then I convolve it with a presynaptic spike train. And then here in blue and red, I just set two different baseline um, parameters. And when we take a nonlinear readout of this accumulated efficacy with different baselines, we exactly get this distinguish between um, uh, this distinction between the sublinear and supralinear facilitation. Um, I want to uh, take a step here and uh, maybe show you another atypical example at the end if I have time. Um, but there's one other thing I really want to focus on, which is that this, all these traditional models and, and this model, they treat the deterministic case of synaptic transmission, um, where we essentially consider the mean EPSC amplitude averaged across um, a lot of trials. But uh, synap synapses are not deterministic, they're highly probabilistic. And um, we, we wanted to, um, extend our model to this uh, stochastic framework. So instead of considering the mean efficacy, we can also consider now a random variable, let's say y, and the postsynaptic response here, the current, is now determined by an instance of this random variable instead of the mean. Um, so in this case, we consider that the, the, these postsynaptic response um, these PSC amplitude or postsynaptic current amplitudes are gamma distributed. Why that is, um, uh, uh, we argue in our paper. Um, but essentially, we now have our linear nonlinear operation, both for the mean and the standard deviation of this gamma distribution. And then each spike is sampled from this gamma distribution with mean, mu, and, and standard deviation sigma. Um, so just to illustrate this briefly, if we have a kernel here again, I, I take a monosynaptic, uh, mono exponential decay as the, the mean kernel. And the, I take three synapses that have varying uh, sigma kernels. So the mean response of each of those synapses is exactly the same. The efficacy at each spike is decreasing. But because of the shape of the sigma kernel, um, here, the, the synapse in green, 
um, will increase its variability, whereas this uh, blue synapse will decrease its variability throughout the spike train. So we can capture um, heteroscedasticity that is often observed in, um, for example, patch clamp experiments with this model. Um, I do think I have briefly time to show you this. Um, another example of, of what we can do in, um, with atypical dynamics is that this, the, the shape of this kernel, so far I've only shown you this kernel in terms of a um, exponential decay, but the kernel can be arbitrary. So there is this, this wonderful paper by Neubrand and colleagues um, where they consider another synapse in the hippocampus um, from a dentate gyrus granule cell onto interneurons. And they do a stimulation protocol in which a control spike is followed by a high frequency burst and then a test spike after a variable time interval. And what they show is this, this highly delayed facilitation where during the burst you, you have facilitation, but the actual EPSC amplitude only peaks um, uh, two seconds after the burst is over. And we can capture such dynamics by um, just considering the shape of the efficacy kernel to be different. So here we, we take an efficacy kernel uh, that is the sum of three Gaussians. And this- uh, If you can wrap it up in uh, one or two sentences, thanks. Oh, sure, sorry. Um, well, essentially by, Varying the kernel and the baseline, we have a very flexible model here that we can use to describe a lot of um, a lot of these atypical dynamics. What I left out is that we have a method to infer parameters from experimental data um, and some more atypical plasticity dynamics in the paper. So, if you want more, um, preprint link is in the chat. All the code is on GitHub. Please play around with it. Hit us up on Twitter. And if you want a real life example of how to use this. In room seven, Michael's just getting ready um, for his talk on the Rafi nucleus. And uh, uh, with that, I just want to thank you and all my co authors, and especially the Neurasmus program, because they funded me during my master's to do this research in Canada. So thanks. And sorry for going over time. Thanks for the wonderful talk. Um, I'm clapping here for uh, on behalf of the audience here. So uh, my sense is that the uh, audience are still typing questions and formulating it. So I'm just going to ask a really obvious uh, a clarification question. So uh, we know that, as you also mentioned, right, uh, one feature of the uh, spike response plasticity models is that uh, that they can make claims about their uh, biophysical plausibility, right? Uh, and you can compare that parameters uh, with measurements from in vitro patch clamp studies, for example. And so uh, in a way, those models have a lot more constraints. Would you say this is why they have difficulty achieve the level of flexibility that your model can do with, you know, different kind of kernels and stuff? Um, yeah, I, I think that that's exactly the point, um, that if, if you have complex dynamics that are usually a combination of different factors that are interacting, um, if you consider a mechanistic approach, you need to essentially include a factor for each of those. And um, there are extensions to the Zodiac Smart Gray model that, that can achieve that. Um, it's just that you accumulate a compendium of parameters in the process. Great, thanks. Uh, we will need to uh, move on with the next speaker, but uh, whenever there are questions that uh, pop up in the Q&A window, uh, you can still uh, stay and ask the audience question in the chat. Sure, thanks, Cheng. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Gan Chao Wei uh, from University of Connecticut. He will present uh, his work on a very related note to the last talk, but instead of a mechanistic model, he will tell us a story more from a statistical point of view. So uh, Gan Chao, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you see my screen? Perfect. Okay. So thank you for this opportunity. Uh, basically today 
I want to introduce my current talk with Dr. Ian Stevenson. That's the similar topic, uh, tracking the fast and slow uh, synaptic nowades uh, by neural spiking data. Uh, basically, now this is a, a synapse. And as I mentioned in, uh, for, uh, in Julian, uh, there's a short-term plasticity, and, which is a story about a neuron transmitter release and uh, long-term plasticity, which is about the post-neuron receptor. And if we record the uh, spiking activities for both pre and post-neuron and plot the cross correlogram, uh, we can uh, view, uh, detect some coupling patterns between them. This is one example from Swartzel's lab. In this cross correlogram, we can see that after some time delay, there's a peak here. That means the post neuron fires nearly immediately after the firing of pre neuron. And based on previous research, uh, actually the coupling pattern or coupling weight will change along the time. And this changes occurs in different time scale. Uh, in the scale of millisecond, the short-term plasticity will give us uh, the short-term changes. But um, for the scale of 